In the ancient world, there was tremendous animosity that existed between Jews and Gentiles. Jewish people looked down upon Gentiles for living immoral, scandalous lives, being ignorant of God's revelation. And Gentiles despised, despised Jewish people for their attitude of condescending arrogance, thinking themselves to be superior in every way. And nothing better really illustrates the sinful pride and the arrogance of Jewish people than the fact that every morning upon awakening, a Jewish man would pray these words, God, I thank thee that thou hast not made me a Gentile, a woman, or a slave. Every day he would pray that. As a former Pharisee, a zealous Jew, the Apostle Paul would certainly have prayed this prayer each morning. And he certainly would have, would have meant it, and he did mean it. But all that changed when Paul met Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior on the road to Damascus. See, not only did Christ save Paul's soul, but he began to transform Paul's character so that Paul now recognized that he was certainly no better than anyone else. In fact, he considered himself worse than others. It was Paul who said that he was the chief of sinners. Christ had changed him from a self-righteous zealot into a humble servant who loved all people and desired all people to experience the same wonderful salvation in Christ that, that he had experienced. And it was this love for all people and his desire for them to know Christ as well as his obedience to his Lord's command that compelled Paul to take the gospel to the Gentiles of his day. And thus the reason that in Acts 16, we find the Apostle Paul in the city of Philippi evangelizing the Gentile Romans of that part of the world. And what's so interesting about Paul's ministry in Philippi is that Luke, the human writer of Acts, focuses on telling us about Paul leading three specific individuals in that city to faith in Christ, a Gentile, a woman, and a slave. The exact kinds of people that Paul once despised, and each day thank God that he hadn't created him to be one of them. But in Christ, these three individuals had now become his family, and they also formed the foundation of the new church in Philippi. They became charter members of that church. And in our previous studies, we've looked at the conversion of two of these individuals. We saw the conversion of Lydia, a woman, and then we saw the conversion of the demon-possessed fortune teller, a slave. This morning, as we finish our study of Acts 16, we're going to examine the conversion of the third individual, the Philippian jailer, a Gentile man. And I remind you that the background leading up to the jailer's conversion was that a serious problem had developed after Paul cast the demon out of the slave girl. As you recall, as a result of casting this demon out of her, her owners were infuriated with Paul because without the demon now possessing her, she could no longer earn them any money because she could no longer do any fortune telling. And so in their rage, they dragged Paul and Silas before the magistrates of the city, who instead of giving them a fair trial, these men immediately tore their clothes off and had them beaten mercilessly with rods, and then they threw them in jail with their feet, then put in some very painful stocks. Now, listen closely, because Luke's purpose in giving us the details about this, this violent persecution against the missionaries is to make the point, which he has been doing continuously throughout the book of Acts, that the gospel will not be halted, it will not be hindered in any way in spite of satanic opposition to it. Just as Jesus had commanded his followers to be witnesses, so they are witnesses of him from Jerusalem to the ends of the earth. And right now, their witness has brought them to the city of Philippi, and it will not be halted regardless of the opposition. Over and over again, Luke has demonstrated that no matter what tactic, no matter what strategy Satan uses to try to silence and even stamp out the church, it just doesn't work. The gospel moves forward, makes progress, no matter what the efforts of the prince of darkness might be. 
And that's precisely the case with Paul and Silas being beaten and then thrown in prison as we're going to see today. Satan will not have his way because God will use the horrific prison experience of these two missionaries to bring about the salvation of the keeper of the jail and his household. Now, as I told you last Sunday, Luke presents the story, the narrative of the jailer's conversion in four sections. First, we see Paul and Silas being physically beaten. Second, we see them in prison. Third, we see them leading the keeper of the jail to faith in Christ. And finally, we see their release from prison. Now, last week we studied the first two of these sections, the physical beating of Paul and Silas, and then their time in prison. Today, as we continue Luke's narrative, our focus is on the next two sections, starting with the third one, which is about Paul and Silas leading the jailer and his household to faith in Christ. Verse 30, and after he brought them out, he said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Now, in order to really understand what is being said here in terms of the meaning of this question that is being asked by this jailer, this man, the keeper of the jail, we have to back up a little bit. We have to give some context to this verse. And so I remind you that the verses preceding this one, they tell us about Paul and Silas and their experience in prison. Starting in verse 25, we read, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there came a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison house were shaken and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were unfastened. When the jailer awoke and saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried out with a loud voice saying, do not harm yourself for we're all here. And he called for lights and rushed in and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Now Luke tells us, that about midnight, on the same day that Paul and Silas had been, been beaten and then thrown in jail, that same day, about midnight, they were praying. And they were singing praises to God. When the Lord suddenly answered their prayers by sending a strong earthquake that shook the foundations of the prison and unfastened the chains of all the prisoners. And when the keeper of the jail, who had been asleep, when he woke up, and he saw that the doors of the jail were open. His first thought was to commit suicide, to take his life, because he assumed that all the prisoners had escaped. And knowing that Roman law required that any jailer who lost a prisoner be held responsible for that loss, and that the penalty for allowing a prisoner to escape was death by execution, this man had very quickly decided that rather than face the humiliation and the pain of execution, he was going to fall on his own sword and take his life. However, Paul realizing what this man was about to do, he cried out to him not to harm himself because all the prisoners, he said, were still here. None had escaped. And after the jailer called them for some lights, as he rushed into the jail, did a quick head count to make sure that this was the case, Luke says that trembling with fear, he then fell down before Paul and Silas. And that now brings us to verse 30, where we again read, and after he brought them out, he said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? So after falling down in fear before Paul and Silas, probably because he recognized that these men of God had something to do with this, this earthquake, the jailer then brought the two missionaries out of the prison into the, the courtyard surrounding it so that he could ask them a question that had been on his heart and something that he had apparently given uh, much thought to. He wanted to know what he needed to do to be saved. Now, this is a remarkable turn of events, isn't it? This man, who only a few hours earlier had put Paul and Silas in stocks, was now humbling himself before them, falling down, shaking with fear, addressing them with great respect as sirs, and asking them how to be saved. This is really, it's really a rather simple question. It's a rather direct question. What must I do to be saved? And you would think that everyone who has ever read this, certainly every Christian who has ever read this, would understand exactly what the Philippian jailer was asking. 
and exactly what Paul and Silas meant in their likewise simple and direct response to him. But surprisingly, folks, that's not the case. So we do need to spend a little time considering what this man was actually asking and what Paul and Silas meant in their answer to his question, which we'll see in a few minutes. So to begin with, I want you to know that there are some, there are some who have looked at these words, what must I do to be saved, and have wondered what kind of salvation was the jailer referring to. One reputable Bible teacher suggested that the jailer may have simply been asking Paul and Silas what he needed to do to be saved from punishment by the Roman authorities. Although this particular teacher said that he doubts that this is what the jailer means, nevertheless, this Bible teacher has written these words. So what was in the mind of the jailer? He might have been saying, look, I'm in real trouble with the Roman authorities because my prison is in shambles and my prisoners are about to escape. How can I be saved from the consequences of this? Will you prisoners tell the authorities that it wasn't my fault? In other words, the thinking is that this man is asking Paul and Silas how he could be safe, what he needed to do to keep himself from physically losing his life at the hands of his authorities. Listen, the reason we know that this man wasn't asking this, he wasn't asking Paul and Silas how he could be saved from being punished by the Roman authorities, is simply because there was no punishment he was facing. He knew there'd be no punishment because none of the prisoners had escaped. There would be no punishment. He wouldn't be concerned about that. It would make absolutely no sense for him to be asking how to be saved from punishment when there would be no punishment. Besides, it'd be silly. In fact, it'd be sheer foolishness for him to ask Paul and Silas, two prisoners, what he needed, what he needed to, be, to do to be saved from being punished by those in authority. Paul and Silas certainly had no influence with the magistrates. These are the men who had just torn their clothes off and, and beaten them and thrown them in jail. We're not going to listen to them. And the final reason we know that this man wasn't asking for help and avoiding punishment by his superiors is because in answering him, which we're going to see in a few moments, Paul and Silas say nothing about being saved from human punishment. If that's what he was asking, why don't they answer it that way? But they didn't. They understood exactly what he was asking. It had nothing to do with being saved from losing his life. No, the, one, the only thing that this man could possibly mean by this question, what must I do to be saved, is what must I do to be saved from my sins? What must I do to be right with the God that, that you speak of? See, this man, like everyone else in Philippi, he had heard that Paul and Silas were proclaiming salvation in Jesus Christ. After all, the demon-possessed young girl had been announcing this Luke says, for many days, remember, she was standing there saying, these men are bondservants of the Most High God and are proclaiming to you the way of salvation. Everybody in Philippi heard it. Listen, this wasn't a metropolis of millions of people. We call it a city. It was really a village, a town. This was the very reason that, this, that they were thrown in, in this man's jail because they were accused of proclaiming salvation in Christ, which was a religious belief that had not been approved by the state. The jailer knew all this. He understood that Paul and Silas were men who told people how to be saved from the coming wrath of God, and now he's asking them how he can be saved. He's heard it in generalities. Now he wants to know specifically. Now he's paying attention. Listen, as I told you last week, this man, this Philippian jailer, was a desperate man. A few minutes ago, he had almost taken his own life. And, and though he had decided not to do this, he knew he wasn't right with God. He knew he wasn't prepared to die. He knew he was a sinner and not ready to face the God who is perfectly holy who therefore demands justice in the form of judgment for all sin. And so he's simply asking Paul and Silas, tell me what I need to do to be saved from my sins, to be rescued, to be delivered from the penalty of my sin and from the wrath of God, the wrath of God that I know I justly deserve. So let me stop here for a moment and ask you how you would answer someone like that if they asked you that question, what must I do to be saved? I hope you would know what to, what to say. 
I hope you wouldn't say, that's a great question. I'd like you to tell my pastor that, and he'll be happy to sit down with you and talk to you. I hope you could explain the way of salvation to a lost soul. If you've been sitting in church and hearing the word of God for years and don't know how to, how to explain the way of salvation, shame on you. Listen, I hope you would know how to speak to someone like this jailer who has come very close to death and he wants answers and he wants them quickly and he wants them clearly. In his commentary on Acts, Kent Hughes writes about Bishop John Taylor Smith who served Britain during World War I as honorary chaplain to Queen Victoria and as the chief chaplain to the British Army. One of the bishop's responsibilities as chief chaplain was to evaluate all candidates who had expressed some interest in becoming chaplains. And in checking out each candidate, the bishop asked only one question, that's all. Here's what he would say to each candidate as he interviewed them. Now, I want you to show me how you would deal with a man. We'll suppose that I'm a soldier who's been wounded on the field of battle. I have three minutes to live, and I'm afraid to die because I do not know Christ. Tell me how I may be saved and die with the assurance that all is well. Now, if the applicant would start talking about the church, the ordinances of the church, given to the church by Jesus, Bishop Smith would say to the candidate, and I quote, that will not do. That will not do. I have only three minutes to live. Tell me what I must do. Now, folks, that's the kind of urgency behind the Philippian jailer's question. Although he isn't on the verge of dying in three minutes, he does want to know what he needs to do to be saved from the wrath of God before it's too late for him, before he does die and passes into eternity. And then he knows he has to give an account of his life to God. After all, this man almost took his life, and now he wants to know how to face death so that he's right with God, and he isn't interested in hearing a rambling theological discourse. He wants to know how to have his soul saved from eternal judgment, and he wants to know it now. And that's how Paul and Silas are going to answer him, because they understand exactly what he's asking. So they're going to tell him what he needs to do to be saved. And their answer is not only significant because of what they say, it is equally significant because of what they don't say. Verse 31. They said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. Now, as I said, it is important to note what Paul and Silas did not say to this man. First of all, they didn't tell him to join the newly established church in Philippi. Nor did they tell him to live by the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do to you. They didn't tell him that he needed to keep the Ten Commandments. They didn't tell him that he needed to first become Jewish before he could be right with God. They didn't tell him to reform his life and start being a better man and stop putting people like us in stocks. They didn't, they didn't say anything like that. None of these things. What they did say is simply believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your household. Now, this answer given by Paul and Silas, it's just critical for us to understand because it reveals the way of salvation. It reveals that the way to be saved from the wrath of God is only by believing in Christ. <laughs> and you would think that such a direct such a, a simple, forthright answer by these missionaries would be understood by everybody who has ever read these words. Once again, sadly, that's not the case. In fact, not only have some people misunderstood the clear meaning of these words, but they have distorted them by changing their meaning so as to convey something that Paul and Silas never intended to be conveyed. So I want to take a few minutes to look at this verse and carefully consider what Paul and Silas meant when they told the Philippian jailer how to be saved. Because how they told this man to be saved is how anyone and everyone who comes to Christ is to be saved. First of all, Paul and Silas directed this man's attention, notice this, to the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because there is salvation in no one else but him. Acts 4:12. Peter said, there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given amongst men 
by which we must be saved. You see, salvation is in a person. It's not in a religious system. It's not in a religion. It's not even in a system of beliefs. It is in a person. And that person is the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus himself said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. They directed him to a person, to Christ. And the reason salvation is in the Lord Jesus Christ is because he, being both God and man, bore our sins in his own body on the cross, being judged and condemned by God the Father in the place of us who deserve judgment. In God's mercy, we did not experience this judgment because Christ experienced it for us. That's why the second thing Paul and Silas told the jailer about being saved is that he needed to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. So what does it mean? What does it mean to believe in Christ? Listen, listen carefully and closely. It means far more than intellectually agreeing with the fact that Christ died for sinners. It means that knowing that Christ has died for sinners, you have placed your trust you have placed your confidence, your reliance on him and his death on the cross that he died for you personally and that his death is the sole basis for you to go to heaven because Christ's death addressed the one thing that bars you from heaven and that is your sin. So Paul and Silas make it very clear that someone, someone is saved simply by, by faith, and faith alone in Christ. But note this, because this is precisely where some have come in and twisted the missionary's words by teaching that something like this they, they have said. Since Paul and Silas didn't tell this man to repent, which means to forsake one's sin, then that proves that repentance isn't necessary for salvation, that repentance isn't a part of saving faith. If it was, Paul would have said it right here. Listen, to come to that conclusion, to draw that conclusion just because the missionaries did not use the word repentance is completely to disregard the context of this passage as well as the context of the rest of Scripture. Concerning the context of this verse, John MacArthur has written in his book, a really great book. If you don't have it, I'd encourage you to get it. It's called Faith Works. He's written these important words. He said the jailer knew very well the cost of being a Christian. He was also obviously prepared to repent. He was about to take his own life when Paul stopped him. He had, he had clearly come to the end of himself. Moreover, Paul gave him a more extensive gospel presentation than is recorded for us in Acts 16.31. Verse 32 says, They spoke the word of the Lord to him together with all who were in his house. Ultimately, the jailer did repent. He proved his repentance by his deeds. The passage cannot be used to prove that Paul preached the gospel without calling sinners to repentance. In addition, I would add that Paul has made it in the rest of Scripture, Paul made it very clear that repentance and faith are inseparable. They are two sides of the same coin. They're always found together in those who have come to salvation in Christ. If there's no repentance, there is no salvation. For example... Paul met with the elders from the church at Ephesus. Acts chapter 20, verses 20 and 21. Here's what he told them. He was, he was looking back at his ministry when he was in Ephesus, and he said, how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you publicly and from house to house. Okay, Paul, so what were you teaching them? Verse 21, solemnly testifying to both Jews and Greeks of repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul said, what I taught was repentance and faith because they go together. And when Paul stood before King Agrippa and gave a defense of himself when he was in Caesarea, he explained the commission that Jesus had given him when he was converted. And in doing so, Paul clearly equates repentance as turning from sin. He defines it. And he also states that it is a part of true saving faith. I read to you Acts 26, starting in verse 17. Now Paul is explaining what Jesus has told him, had told him on the road to Damascus as he saved him and commissioned him. 
rescuing you, as Jesus' words to Paul, rescuing you from the Jewish people and from the Gentiles to whom I'm sending you. To open their eyes, here's what Paul's going to do, to open their eyes so that they may turn from, notice, turn from darkness to light and from the dominion of Satan to God. That's repentance. They're turning that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. So, King Agrippa, I did not prove disobedient to this heavenly vision, but kept declaring both to those at Damascus first and, all, and also at Jerusalem, and then throughout all the region of Judea and even to the Gentiles. Here's what Paul said, I proclaim that they should repent and turn to God, performing Deeds appropriate to repentance. You have it from Paul. Paul so very clearly taught repentance as an essential part of true saving faith. It always goes together with faith. In fact, looking back at my own conversion as an 18-year-old, I, I didn't know terms like repentance. I didn't, I didn't even know terms like saving faith, but I, I knew the concept of repentance because I didn't want to continue living the way I had been living. I didn't want to continue being in charge of my own life. I, I didn't want to continue living a life of sinful self-absorption and self-centeredness and rebellion to God. And so without even knowing the theological term repentance, I did repent and I turned to Christ to save me. But I am afraid that repentance is the missing element in the experience of many who claim to be saved but are not. They may have prayed the sinner's prayer for salvation, but they have never renounced their sin and the way they've been living. And they, therefore, they have deceived themselves into thinking that they are Christians when indeed they are not. So examine your heart. Make sure that your faith isn't simply a mental agreement with some Bible truths about, about Jesus. Make sure that you have forsaken living in rebellion to Christ and that you've placed your trust in him for salvation with a heart attitude of submission to him as Lord. Those are the elements of true saving faith. Now, in addition then to directing the jailer to the person of Jesus Christ and telling him that he needed to believe on this person for salvation, the third thing that Paul and Silas told the jailer is that if he did believe on Christ, then he would surely be saved. What they meant by this is that the person who comes to Christ, trusting him for salvation from judgment, will certainly be saved from the eternal wrath of God because Jesus refuses no one who comes to him for salvation. Remember, this man wanted to be saved. He doesn't want the possibility of being saved. What must I do to be saved? Believe on Christ, you will be saved. Jesus said in John 6, 37, all that the Father gives me, meaning all who are chosen, will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. What a great truth. You come to Christ for salvation, he'll never turn you away. Now you have to come on his terms, repentance, faith but he'll never turn you away. So this is what Paul and Silas meant when in response to the jailer's question, what must I do to be saved? They said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. I want you though to notice that they added something to the end of their answer. They added the words, you and your household. Now once again, we're faced with an interpretive question. Did they mean by this, that if the jailer believed in Christ, then his entire household, which would certainly include his family as well as his servants, maybe even relatives and guests who were there, would automatically be saved? Is that what he was saying? Are Paul and Silas telling the jailer that his faith will be enough to save his entire household? No, not at all. Salvation doesn't work like that. It's on an individual basis. The missionaries are simply saying that if he believes in Christ, then he will be saved. And if the members of his household also come to believe in Christ, then they'll be saved too. In fact, later on in this chapter, we're going to see that they did believe. They were saved. But this is an automatic salvation because one member believes. This is precisely why we read in the next verse that Paul and Silas explained the gospel in more detail to the jailer as well as to his household. Notice verse 32. They spoke the word of the Lord to him together with all who were in his house. After telling him that salvation is by believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, the jailer then, he gathers the members of his household around Paul and Silas, probably 
probably because they were all standing outside the house. Remember, there's just been an earthquake. So everybody in the whole community is standing around outside of their home. And as they gathered together, he said, come, come over here. Come around these prisoners. Paul and Silas then had the opportunity to explain more fully the plan of salvation, not only to him, but to also to his entire family, to his servants, his guests. And, and no doubt, no doubt going into far more detail about such matters as sin, <coughs> the deity of Christ, God's holiness, God's judgment, faith and repentance, issues like that. And as a result of their gospel witness, the jailer came to faith in Christ as well as the members of his household, and he, he gave immediate evidence that his salvation was genuine by what he did next. Notice what we read in verses 33 and 34. And he took them that very hour of the night and washed their wounds, and immediately he was baptized, he and all his household, and he brought them into his house and set food before them and rejoiced, greatly. Why did he rejoice? Having believed in God with his whole household. He believed, they believed, and now you see the immediate, immediate transformation that has taken place in this jailer's life after placing his trust in Christ. And these actions are some of the, the fruits of this man's repentance, the fruit of his salvation, the evidence that he was saved. So pay close attention to what we're about to go over because in principle, these are the same types of evidence that ought to be in your life if you've truly believed on Christ for salvation. First of all, he washed out the wounds of Paul and Silas. That's remarkable. Only a few hours earlier, he had put them in painful stocks because he didn't care about them. They're just common criminals to him. He treated them as roughly as he treated any other criminals. But he now treats them with great tenderness and care. He washes out the wounds on their, their back so they won't get infected. They have been violently whipped. He's washing them out. Why? Because he understands immediately they're his brothers in Christ. These Jewish men are now his brothers in Christ. Remember, there wasn't there Jewish men even in this town. That's why they didn't have a synagogue there. He's washing out their wounds. They're his brothers. He's showing them brotherly love. And folks, that's exactly what Jesus said is the mark of being one of his followers. In John 13, 35, Jesus said, by this all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So I ask you, do you have this kind of love for other Christians? Or do you feel more comfortable with being around non-Christians? If you have love for other believers, then you're one of Christ's disciples. He's changed your heart so that you now love the brethren rather than hate them. Secondly, the jailer and his household were immediately baptized. Now, obviously, Paul and Silas had to tell these folks that Jesus commanded his disciples to publicly confess him as Lord by being baptized in water. And in obedience, and they've heard this now for the first time, in obedience to their new Lord, that's exactly what they do. And this would have been very public. Why? Because I told you, everybody in the community has just experienced an earthquake. They're all outside of their homes, probably being concerned about aftershocks. They're outside. It's in the middle of the night. They're talking. Nobody wants to go back in, in the house. And so they would have been awake, the community. They would have observed this man and his household being baptized. They would have certainly understood that the jailer and his family have just become Christians. Third, the jailer brought Paul and Silas into his house, and he served them a meal. And why is that so significant? Well, because one of the evidences of being a true Christian is demonstrating hospitality, which literally means the love of strangers, and that's exactly what this man did. In James chapter 2, starting in verse 14, we read, what use is it, my brethren, if someone says he has faith, but he has no works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and be filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead being by itself. What this man did is he demonstrated his faith by his work of hospitality. 
What a great, what a great truth. He gave his food. He gave his resources. He invited them in. He showed them his faith by his works. Fourth evidence of this man's salvation, as well as those in his household, was that they, they greatly rejoiced. Remember, early in, earlier in the evening, this man's ready to take his own life. Now he's rejoicing. Now he's rejoicing. And listen, his joy isn't because none of the prisoners had escaped and his life was spared. It's because he has believed on Christ and he knows that he's saved. He now has the same kind of joy that moved Paul and Silas to sing praises to God at midnight while in jail. Folks, this man was really transformed by the grace of God. And this was only the beginning. It's just a few hours, or, or at this point, probably a few minutes into his salvation. And yet his, his actions, his attitudes, evidence that he's a new person in Christ. So the question is, is there evidence in your life? I realize we all struggle with sin, but is there, is there evidence in your life? Do you, uh, you know Christ, do you love and serve other Christians? Is that your desire? Have you been publicly baptized as a believer? There'll be four tonight who will be, but have you been? If you're a believer and you have not been baptized, you're a disobedient believer. Do you show hospitality to others in terms of sharing your home, your food, your resources with them? Do you rejoice in Christ because you're saved? These are the kinds of things you should be asking yourselves. These are the kinds of evidences that demonstrate Christ is living in you. And, and if, if these types of fruits are evident in your life, then you can be assured that Christ has saved you and he is in the process of transforming your character. But listen, if these fruits are not in your life at all, and they never have been, then it indicates you have never really trusted Christ for salvation. So, as the scripture says, examine yourselves to see if you be in the faith. Now, all that we have studied thus far has focused on the conversion of the Philippian jailer, which took place shortly after midnight, and while Paul and Silas were technically still prisoners in jail. But as Luke continues, he, move, he moves on to the fourth section of this narrative in which he tells us about what happened the following morning as we look at the release of Paul and Silas from prison. Verses 35 to 39. Now when day came, the chief magistrate sent their policemen saying, release those men. And the jailer reported these words to Paul saying, the chief magistrates have sent to release you. Therefore, come out now and go in peace. But Paul said to them, they have beaten us in public without trial, men who are Romans, and have thrown us into prison. And now are they sending us away secretly? No, indeed. But let them come themselves and bring us out. The policemen reported these words to the chief magistrates. They were afraid when they heard that they were Romans. And they came and appealed to them. And when they had brought them out, they kept begging them to leave the city. Now, Luke tells us that early the next day, the Roman government officials sent their policemen to the prison, ordering the jailer to release Paul and Silas. Now, why they did this, we're not told. Most likely, their thinking was that the beating that they had given them and the night in jail was sufficient punishment and would teach them a lesson so that they would never do this again. They just leave town quietly. But when the jailer told Paul and Silas that they were free to go, surprisingly, Paul refused. And he said to the policeman, no, we're not leaving. We're not leaving quietly because what has been done to us, beating us in public without giving us a trial and then throwing us in prison was illegal because we are Roman citizens. So we're not leaving quietly, no. You tell the magistrates that if they want us to leave, they need to come to the jail and personally escort us out. You see, what Paul was referring to when he says that he and Silas were Roman citizens is that it was illegal for any Roman citizen to receive a public beating or imprisonment or death without a fair trial. So what Paul is really saying is that a grave injustice has been done to them. The law has been broken. And he wants the authorities to acknowledge that this is the case. So the question then, as you look at this, is why is Paul doing this? Why did Paul do this thing? Was he being vengeful? 
Was the apostle retaliating for what had been done to he and Silas? Was, was this a display of his Roman citizen pride? Not at all. None of these things. This had nothing to do with vengeance or spite or pride. Listen closely. Paul did this solely to protect the new believers in Philippi who would, he would be leaving behind you see, if he and Silas had left town quietly, knowing that the law had been broken, without reminding these government officials to do their job of upholding Roman justice, then it would have left the church at Philippi very vulnerable to more injustices done against them by these very same officials. In other words, Paul did this to protect the church in Philippi from any abuses from these same men. He wanted to make sure that the church would not be subject to any unjust treatment from these government officials. So he, he demanded his rights as a Roman citizen, not for his sake, but for their sake. By making these officials come to the jail and escort he and Silas out. Why? Because by doing this, these men would be acknowledging that what they did to them was wrong. And that Paul and Silas had done nothing wrong. He wanted them to acknowledge it. He wanted it to be public. That's exactly what these men did. And the reason the magistrates agreed to this was because they recognized that they were in big trouble. They recognized that their actions of mistreating Paul and Silas as Roman citizens could have devastating effects and consequences on them as well as on their city. Listen, if Rome found out about this... Two things could happen. Not, first of all, they could lose their jobs. And secondly, Rome could withdraw the status of Philippi as a Roman colony. This was very serious. It may very well have been that when they were beating them, Paul and Silas kept trying to say, but we're Roman citizens and nobody listened to them. But the fact is now they're saying this. And so they, these magistrates very humbly come to the prison they, acknowledging, they acknowledge how wrong they were, probably saying something like, oh, Mr. Paul, Mr. Silas, we're so sorry. We didn't know. And then they escort Paul and Silas out of the prison, thus acknowledging their innocence publicly so that others could see. But while doing this, they kept begging the missionaries, please, please, we know we're wrong. Please leave our city. And no doubt because they didn't want another disturbance to arise. So Paul and Silas agree to leave the city, but not until they do one thing which Luke tells us about as he closes the chapter with verse 40. They went out of the prison and entered the house of Lydia. And when they saw the brethren, they encouraged them and departed. So before leaving Philippi, we read that Paul and Silas, they went to the house of Lydia, the wealthy businesswoman who had apparently decided to open her, her rather large home for the new church to meet there. And notice what happened when the missionaries saw the brethren at Lydia's house. Instead of asking for their encouragement, saying, look, guys, we were beaten, we were thrown in prison, we've spent that time in jail, it was really rough. Instead of asking for their encouragement, Luke says that they encouraged these new believers, and then they left. I, I love this. See, Paul was always looking out for others. His shepherding heart always put the sheep first. I mean, that's why he said, we're not leaving the jail until they come and acknowledge that they've done an illegal injustice to us. Always put the sheep first, never his own welfare. He thought of their protection from the government harassment. He made sure that these people were encouraged, even though he had been the one persecuted. They hadn't been persecuted. He had. So once again, we see that in spite of Satan's intention of hindering the gospel, harming the church, he failed. He failed. God used this persecution to bring not only the jailer and his family to Christ, but to ensure that this brand new church of brand new believers would not be hassled by unjust Roman government officials. And those who made up this church were who? They were Gentiles, women, and slaves. Because the gospel is for all who see their need of Christ. Standings in society mean nothing. You just need to see their need for Christ. 
and then they come to him. So do you see your need for Christ? Have you seen your need for Christ? The jailer did. He knew he wasn't ready to die. He knew he needed to be saved. I hope you do too. I hope that you are a believer. But if not, if you want to know more about salvation, then I urge you, we close the service in a few minutes, come up to the front. There'll be one of our, our elders here, one of our pastors who would be happy to explain more fully the way of salvation, even as Paul and Silas did to the Philippian jailer in his household. Now, if you do claim Christ, you claim to know Christ, then make sure that there are evidences in your life that are there only because Christ has changed you. Love for the brethren and obedience to Christ's commands. Those are just some of the fruits of repentance. If you have them, you can be assured of your salvation. If you've never had them, you're not saved. I'm going to close in prayer, and then Joel's going to come and close the service. Father, we thank you for the story of this man and his household's conversion, how kind you were to take this man who was so desperate, so frantic, so ready to kill himself and yet not ready to die, that you mercifully gave him salvation. Lord, we pray that those here who have never turned to Christ, today might be the day of their salvation. And for those of us who have trusted you, Lord, may there, there be the assurance in our hearts that we really know you as we, as we look at our lives to see if Christ has changed us. We realize, Lord, that assurance is not simply because of evidence in our lives. That's part of it. But we look to Christ, and we remember that he died for us. He and his death, that's the anchor of our soul. So, Lord, I pray for any here who might struggle with assurance, but they really know you. I pray that, that what they've heard today would help them. Now, Lord, we do pray that you'll help us to ponder these truths, to consider them, to have these truths permeate us, that we would recognize that you indeed are on the throne. And even though persecution is going on around the world, and it's real, and it's violent in many places, yet the gospel advances. We thank you for that, and we ask you to keep doing that. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.